Welcome to the Jewelry Resellers Podcast, your go-to source for all things shiny, sparkly, and of course, profitable. I'm your host, Desiree, and I'll be your guide on this dazzling journey through the world of reselling jewelry. We'll be diving deep into the art and science of reselling, uncovering valuable tips, insider secrets, and sharing stories from successful jewelry resellers. We'll explore market trends, industry news, and even discuss how to find those hidden gems just waiting to be discovered in thrift stores, estate sales, and beyond. So if you're dreaming of turning your hobby into a hustle, or if you're a seasoned pro looking to stay at the top of your jewelry reselling game, join me each week for insights, stories, and more on the Jewelry Resellers Podcast. Okay, so today we're going to talk about something that concerns a lot of jewelry sellers and resellers. But before we begin, I want to say hello and welcome you to this episode of the podcast. My name is Desiree. And on this podcast, we talk about all things jewelry reselling related. Now, if you are just getting started, I do want to let you know about a freebie I have that can help you out. Now, a lot of People have questions about what sells the best as it relates to jewelry, especially if you're a reseller. And if you are focused on selling vintage jewelry, then I have a list that I want to send to you. It is a list of the 20 best, best selling, (laughs) 20 of the best selling vintage jewelry brands that every reseller should know. So this is my personal list of the top 20 brands as it relates to vintage jewelry. And so when you're outsourcing or when you're out looking around and you come across some jewelry, you will know and you will recognize the brands that you definitely want to pick up because they have a very high sell through rate and a really good resale value. And so this is what you want to keep an eye out for. So if you'd like to get a copy of that list, all you have to do is head on over to the website and that is jewelryresellerspodcast.com. That's jewelryresellerspodcast.com. And there will be a link in the show notes as well. All right, so let's go ahead and get into today's topic. We're going to talk about how to avoid being scammed when you're selling your jewelry. Because this is something that a lot of people are worried about, something that scares a lot of people off from doing this business. But I'm going to share with you quite a few tips that I have learned over the years and also talking with and working with other jewelry sellers and resellers. These are some things that you can really do to put yourself in a good and a strong position so you are not taken advantage of, you know, taken advantage of, not scammed. Because it is scary, and especially if you're selling jewelry online, sometimes the sophistication of these scams and these criminals is just getting better and better. You know, obviously there's there's the types of scams that are we can easily recognize, you know, with the poor grammar or, you know, someone obviously saying, what is your number, what is your bank account information, things like that. But like I said, the degree of sophistication nowadays is getting better, and I think it will continue to improve, unfortunately, because so many people are struggling for whatever reason, and some people just are not good people. You know, that's just kind of the unfortunate truth about the world. But let's go ahead and talk about some things that I believe will help you so you can keep you and your jewelry safe. Okay, now especially if you're planning to sell higher end pieces, uh, this is something you want to pay attention to because because you don't have to you don't have to put yourself in 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 the position to be taken advantage of. I guess that's probably the best way to say it. All right, so I've got quite a few tips here and I do have my notes in front of me as I always do. So let's go ahead and start with tip number one to avoid getting scammed or taken advantage of. All right, so number one, we want to research the buyer if possible. 
Okay. Now, if you're selling online, sometimes you can do this. You know, if you're selling on eBay, you can take a look at the buyer's profile. If you're selling on one of the other platforms, I'm positive you can do the same thing that way. Now, if you're selling to an individual, you if it's possible, you may want to do some background checks. And I'm not saying you have to pay to hire a private investigator or anything like that. But if there's someone who is online, let's say on eBay, you want to look at their feedback. You want to look at how long they have had their account. But sometimes that's not always accurate because there are people who will come across something on eBay and they don't have an account, but they want to buy that item that they will go ahead and, and open a brand new account just to buy your item. I've had that happen a couple of times. Or sometimes it's someone uh, international and they, again, stumble across your item and they want to buy it and they don't have an account, so they're going to have a brand new account. So that's not always an indicator of someone trying to scam you, but it is something to take into consideration. So you also want to look at their feedback, if there's any testimonials or, or anything like that. Um, again, most platforms do have this for buyers and sellers. Sometimes it's public, sometimes it's not. But whatever you can do in order to research your buyer, you want to do that. Now, if you're selling to an individual in person, uh, you may want to see if you can do a Google search of the person's name or maybe check out their social media and make sure that they are who they claim to be. Because I have never had this happen, but I know that there are people out there who impersonate other people specifically so they can run some type of a scam. So do whatever you can to research your buyer ahead of time. Okay, so that's tip number one. All right, tip number two is to know your jewelry's worth. All right, so if you have a really high end or very rare piece, you may want to consider having your jewelry appraised. Now, if you are selling on eBay, eBay does have an authentication program depending on the price of your item. Poshmark has it too. And um, if you're selling on something, you know, someplace like the Real Real or something like that, they also will authenticate your items to make sure that they are legitimate or that they're real. But this is all to help you know what exactly it is that you have. So that way, if someone tries to lowball you or someone tries to negotiate with you, you know exactly what you have, what its value is and how much it's worth. OK, because sometimes this knowledge will help you filter out people who, who are trying to scam you, who are trying to get away, you know, with with giving you less than what you truly deserve as it relates to selling that piece. Okay, so know your jewelry's worth. The more information you have about it, the better you can be discerning when it comes to dealing with potential customers or buyers. Okay. All right, tip number three is to use trusted platforms. I think this is kind of a given, but of course I wanted to mention it here. You wanna sell through reputable websites, stores, or auction houses. And again, if you have a really high-end, valuable, rare piece, you want to sell someplace that deals with that type of merchandise or those types of items. You know, certain auction houses are known for handling and selling jewelry. And depending on what kind of piece you have, you may want to go that route. Now, yes, it will cost you a little bit in fees, but at least the headache then gets transferred on to the auction house, you know, or that, that particular, um, what is it, website. Okay, so if selling online, you want to use platforms with secure payment, payment methods and protection policies for sellers. Again, this is something that you probably may already have set up, especially if you're selling on eBay where they do have protection for buyers and sellers. But if you're not selling on eBay, if you're selling somewhere else, make sure that there is some type of seller protection and that you review what those terms and conditions are because you don't want to do a transaction and then not follow the rules and then realize that you're not protected.
Okay, so that's going to take a little bit of time for you to learn, especially depending on what platform you're going to use. But uh, most of them do have some type of seller protection in place, and it's your responsibility as the seller to know what those details are. Okay, let's hop on over to tip number four, and that is to avoid rush decisions. Now, this is the thing about these scammers. They often pressure sellers to make quick decisions. Or they say, hey, you know, I, I only have such and such amount of money, you know, and maybe it's less than what you're asking. And they'll say, but, you know, if, if you um, let me buy it right now, I'll, I'll cash app this to you or I'll wire this money to you or whatever, you know, however <laughs> they're phrasing it. But you want to really take your time and research these offers and don't rush into a sale. Don't feel pressure. Don't allow anyone to pressure you into making a quick decision. Okay, because again, you're the seller. This is your item and the buyer will have to pretty much accommodate to your rules or whatever it is, your boundaries, whatever it is that you you are asking. You know, as long as you're not being unreasonable, of course, but I don't think any of us are have the intention to do that. So don't feel pressured, don't feel rushed, and don't feel like you have to get back to somebody right away. It's okay to let someone know, hey, I need to think about this, or, you know, let me do a little bit of research and I'll get back to you in the next couple days or so. Because if someone is really serious about buying your item, they have no problem waiting. I mean, of course, they're probably anxious because they want to get it. But they understand that if this is a big sale or if this is a really rare piece, you know, they understand that it's going to take you a little bit of time maybe to research something or maybe to come back with a counter offer or something like that. OK, but you don't want to make them wait too long, of course. But again, uh, you know, do what you feel comfortable with. And remember, you call the shots in this transaction. All right, tip number five is to secure payment first, if possible. Never, 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 never ship your jewelry before receiving payment. Never. And surprisingly, people's, people do this. I have been, I, I've unfortunately seen people get caught up in this and they ship out the jewelry and, and it just turns into a mess. Okay, so don't don't do that. Don't put yourself in that position. All right. You want to use secure traceable payment methods. Okay. So I do not recommend cash app. I do not recommend Venmoing anybody, anything. I mean, unless, unless you know this person, you know, if it's maybe somebody in your family or something like that, and, and you could track them down <laughs> if something were to go awry. But for the most part, I, I come from the belief that, especially if it's an expensive piece, you should definitely send an invoice and you should use a, a payment system that will allow you to upload shipping information so that way the buyer can track the item. And you also want to make sure that, you know, you have the option of buying additional insurance if that's necessary. Okay. Now, the other thing I want you to remember is to not accept checks or money orders. All right. Do not meet someone somewhere and, and say, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take a check or a money order or a cashier's check, whatever, whatever the case may be, because a lot of times these are fraudulent and you would have no way of knowing that while you're in the meeting, you know, unless you, you won't know until you go to the bank and actually try to deposit or cash it, that it's a fraudulent check. So my best advice is to avoid accepting checks or money orders altogether. You will accept electronic payment or cash. Okay. Now, tip number six is to meet in a safe location. Now, if you are accepting cash, you definitely want to meet in a safe location. Now, if you're meeting a buyer in person, please choose a public place. Now, this is a really good thing, but many police stations offer safe exchange zones for online transactions. So if you are selling something that is really rare, 
you know, something that could be worth thousands upon thousands of dollars. Um, and, and you're accepting cash. <laughs> uh, this is something I definitely recommend you do. I would say, yes, we can meet at the police station because it is a safe exchange zone. And that way, you know that you will, you know, if something were to happen, you're, you're in the place where something could be done about it or, or where you're going to be protected. You know, and, and this is, again, you know, I guess I should, should say, or maybe I should have said at the beginning, you know, you're only going to be able to do what you're comfortable with. If for some reason you're not comfortable meeting someone at the police station, even though that's an obviously safe place, you don't have to do that. You can say, hey, I'm only accepting payment online. Once that payment clears, then I will ship out your item with tracking and insurance or whatever, you know, because I don't want anyone to feel like they have to overstep their own personal boundaries just to make a sale. Okay, so just remember that. All right, so tip number seven is to get everything documented. All right, so you want to ensure that all agreements, especially concerning returns, are in writing. Keep records of all communications, transactions, and descriptions of the jewelry sold. Now, depending on what platform you are selling on, a lot of this stuff will be handled within that platform right? They will have your messages, your back and forth, you know, if there was any type of communication back and forth, that will all be saved. Your, the transaction itself will be saved. And of course, your jewelry description, depending on how or where you list it, that will be saved as well. But if you're not using one of the platforms and you're just selling this yourself, like on Facebook marketplace or something, you know, something like that, then you want to make sure that you keep track of everything. Because if something again were to, were to happen or something were to go sideways, at least you would have all of that as evidence and documentation. If God forbid you had to fill out a police report or something like that. Okay. So, you know, and even even on the platforms, I want to say this too, like once the transaction is done, the person gets their item, you get paid. Don't delete any of those messages. Don't delete any of those emails back and forth, whatever, because you'd be surprised how a month later somebody will come back or even six months later, someone will come back and say, hey, I bought this. Remember you told me X, Y, and Z. And you may not have any memory of that because it happened six months ago. So I always say keep your transactions for at least a year, you know, but if, if that's not what you want to do, of course, you don't have to. But, you know, it's always safe to make sure, especially when you have these high end, high end, high dollar sales, you want to make sure that you keep track of it in every way possible. All right, let's hop on to tip number eight, and that is to be cautious with your personal information. Always be mindful of the, per of the personal information that you share with potential buyers. Okay, again, if you're selling on a specific platform, you may not have to worry about this because usually, uh, especially if you're selling on eBay, they're only going to know your username, <laughs> you know, unless maybe you share your, your first name or something like that. But for the most part, I only use my username when I'm selling on eBay. I don't give people my real name. I mean, of course, they could they could find it. It's not like I'm hiding it, but I don't really give out my, my personal information on any of the resale platforms that I sell on. But you want to make sure you avoid sharing sensitive information that could put you at risk of identity theft. So that's really the main thing here. Now, I see this being a problem more so on Facebook. Uh, you know, if you're selling on Facebook Marketplace, I don't necessarily recommend that for high-end jewelry pieces, although some people do and it's not been a problem for them. But you want to make sure that you do not allow yourself to become the victim of identity theft, okay? So really be protective of your personal information. All right. Tip number nine is to ship securely. 
Now, shipping is one of my favorite things to do as it relates to reselling. I don't know why. I think because I love wrapping gifts, and to me, that's what it feels like. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but I really enjoy the shipping process. But if you are shipping jewelry, make sure you use insured and trackable shipping methods. Now, of course, this goes without saying, but you want to require signature upon delivery to ensure it reaches the buyer. And this also protects you so someone can't say, oh, I never received it, because sometimes that will happen. Sometimes an item will be tracked and it will show as delivered, but then the person will say, well, I never got it. Okay, and the other thing about uh, the signature required is it also prevents, it prevents a package being left on someone's doorstep or, or a package just being left in someone's mailbox, especially if it's something very expensive, you definitely don't want that to happen. So if it's a signature required, obviously the person will either have to go to the, the post office because the mailman will probably leave like a little slip that says, hey, you need to sign for this. Or your mail carrier may come to your door and say, hey, you need to sign for this. And then they will hand the package directly to the buyer. So there's no like just leaving it somewhere where it could get damaged, lost or stolen. OK, so. Again, it is worth the few extra dollars for these things for insurance and signature required. OK, pay the extra ten dollars or whatever it is. Trust me, it will give you so much peace of mind. OK, tip number 10 is to, if you feel the need, consult a professional. You know, if you don't know what your piece is worth or maybe you have an idea, but you just want confirmation that it is what you think it is, then seek some advice from a trusted jeweler or maybe even a legal advisor, or maybe someone who does uh, online estate sales or, or auction houses, whatever. You know, someone who can give you some guidance based on their own experience and their knowledge, especially if they specialize in selling jewelry. It's not a bad idea to reach out to these people and say, hey, you know, what's, uh, you know, what do I need to, to worry about? Or what do I need to think about? Or what do I need to know selling these types of pieces? You know, and sometimes you may need to pay for a consultation or sometimes they can, this is something that they can help you with, maybe through an email or a quick phone call, whatever. So, but don't be afraid to ask for help, okay? And, and there are people out there who can help you in this type of transaction or in this type of business and people who do this on the day to day. Okay, so I think this is just something we need to remember that no matter what we're doing, no matter what we're selling, there's somebody out there who knows this upwards, downwards, backwards and forwards. <laughs> All right. And we want to we want to network and connect with these people, you know, in, in any way that we can. It's all about the relationships. Okay, let's move on to tip number 11, and this is use an escrow service for high value items. All right, for super expensive pieces, consider using an escrow service. This will add a layer of protection as the escrow service only releases funds to the seller once the buyer receives and approves the item. Now, I have never done this, but I, you know, when I was doing some research for this episode, I saw that this is an option. Now, escrow services can be for anything. I've, I've heard of people using them for houses, obviously, but also things like cars and boats and, and equipment, you know, all kinds of things. So if this is something that you know, you might want to take into consideration as another layer of protection. Uh, this is this is a good idea. Again, and depending on how how expensive the piece is, if it's something that's tens of thousands of dollars, this would not be a bad idea. OK, and of course, the escrow service will take a percentage. But again, uh, for me, that would be worth it to. To alleviate myself of the stress and the headache of worrying about you know, is, is this good? You know, is this person going to pay? Is, is their check going to be good? Or are, are the funds going to go through? 
you know, so again, this is something to consider. But again, it, I would only do this if, if your piece was really, really expensive. All right, tip number 12. Now, this is a tricky one. I've seen people fall victim to this, not only with selling jewelry, but with other, you know, other things, just selling in general. And this is to beware of overpayments. This is a type of scam, okay? You wanna be cautious if a buyer offers to pay more than the asking price and then requests a refund of the difference. This is a highly common scam tactic, all right? So if someone says, hey, you know, your piece of jewelry is 500, but I'll, I'll give you $700 and can you just refund me the difference? The answer is going to be no absolutely no and run away now even though some of these scams are obvious to some people they're not especially if you're just getting started or maybe you don't know anything or maybe you know you just in in inherited a collection you know and you don't know what you have you don't know that you're sitting on tens of thousands of of dollars worth of jewelry uh, I would love that to happen to me, although I don't think it will. <laughs> but, you know, you never know how, how people end up in these types of situations. And I've seen this happen time and time again. All right. So the thing is, is to be, be cautious. And now that you know that this is a type of scam, you are more knowledgeable and more aware and you will not become a victim to it. Okay. And I always say it's better to be more cautious than not. You know, it's, there, there's nothing wrong with saying no. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I don't trust this. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I don't know. I think that it's better to err on the side of safety than to just kind of take a chance, really not knowing what you're getting into. All right, tip number 13. This is to avoid sharing banking information. Never, never, never share your banking details directly with buyers. That is absolutely unnecessary. They do not need that information in any way, shape, or form because you will use a reputable payment platform to handle the transaction, okay? Now, remember, we've talked about this. Usually the platform will have all of this stuff already built in, so you don't have to worry about setting up, you know, I don't know, a Venmo or a Cash App. Now I'm not I'm not hating on Venmo or Cash App because I know people do use that. However, I f I find that there's a lack of protection using those, and I I just don't I would not trust a, using that for a a large a large dollar amount transaction. I just would not. All right, so never give your banking information out. Again, that's how you're going to protect yourself. You're going to protect your account and protect your money as well. All right, so my last tip for you is to watch out for fake profiles. Now, we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, you know, when, it, when I had said to research your buyer. But online buyers or sellers with little to no history, really vague profiles, or ones who use stock images as their profile picture, can be red flags. Now, again, this isn't always the case. I don't want to say that is if someone has a, a new profile, that they're a scammer. Of course not. But sometimes you can pick up on these things, right? It's something to take into consideration, you know, when you're making your final decision of whether or not to do business with someone. And a lot of times these profiles, they won't have any type of information in, their, in the bio. Or if they do, sometimes you'll see a bunch of grammatical errors or misspellings or just weird text that doesn't really make sense. Or sometimes you'll even see something in a different language. And again, I'm not saying that text in a different language is a red flag, but if someone is, is looking to buy something on a, on a site that's in English, then uh, you would hope that they would have the ability to communicate in English as well. And if they don't, then uh, I would say, I'm sorry, but I can't go f through with this or, or I can't answer your questions or whatever because uh, I can't communicate with you. Okay, so these are some things you wanna think about. Now, 
scams do not happen all the time. I don't want to scare anybody. I don't want to make anyone, you know, super nervous about selling jewelry. But these are some things and these are some tips that I think you just need to keep in mind if you're going to do this because it can happen. It is a possibility. But I want to say out of all of my years of reselling, I only got, and I wouldn't even consider this a scam. I just knew the the guy was lying because he said that uh, something arrived broken and he couldn't give me a clear picture of it. And so I gave him a partial refund, which I probably should not have done. But, you know, this was early on and I didn't really know any better and I I just kind of believed him. But then after the fact, when I looked at, you know, the communication, the messages back and forth, and when I looked at the one photo he sent trying to claim that the item was broken, I had, I I knew after the fact that this guy probably just wanted, wanted to get, you know, a cheaper um, cost for the item. Like he just wanted a partial refund. He didn't want to pay as much as, as much as he paid. And I mean, like I said, that's not really a scam per se. It's just somebody lying (laughs) to get a discount. But you'll, I mean, you'll get those too. You'll get those people who will say, hey, these earrings don't fit. So can I get a partial refund? You know, you'll get people asking ridiculous things like that. You know, or you'll get somebody who swaps out something. They have the same exact necklace, but it's broken. You send them one that's not broken. And then they say, hey, the necklace you sent me, it's broken. You know, they'll do the old switcheroo. So things like that do happen. But again, it's only happened once in all of my time of reselling jewelry. And I don't think it's something to that should turn anybody off if you really want to do this. You know, it's just more about being aware, being educated and being knowledgeable about how scams and scammers operate. Okay, Uh, let me see and make sure there's nothing else I want to share with you as it relates to this topic. Now, the other thing too is, um, oh, I did want to share this with you. I have sold jewelry pieces that have gone into the hundreds. I've never sold anything that's gone into the thousands, at least not yet. But I have sold jewelry pieces for a few hundred dollars and I always always send those with uh, priority shipping because I use USPS most of the time because all of those transactions, all of those sales were on eBay. So I used eBay shipping, but I do send them priority, even if it's just a tiny little thing. I I send it in a priority uh, envelope and then I put the item in a box and then I always get insurance like we talked about earlier and I always do signature required and I have never had an issue with any of these uh, high dollar sales okay never I've never had anybody say they didn't get it or or any any problems it's been fantastic you know knock on wood but uh, I just want to share that because for the most part, you probably won't have to deal with scammers. And I, I really hope that you never do. But at least now you're, you're more cognizant of what can happen and how you can really avoid being caught in one of these types of situations. Okay, so closing out by following these precautions, you can definitely significantly reduce the risk of being scammed when selling or reselling your jewelry. You want to always listen to your instincts. And if something feels off, it's better to walk away from the deal. Okay. We talked about that earlier too. If, if something just is not sitting right with you, don't be afraid to say no and to walk away. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you found this information helpful and useful. If you have any questions or if there's anything I may have missed, please leave a comment and let me know because if I do need to do a follow-up to this, I absolutely will do so. But uh, I hope that you will take this, this information and run with it so you can stay protected and stay profitable. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I will check in with you again really soon.